So hi, thanks to the organizer for this nice uh, workshop, uh, also for giving me the chance uh, to speak to you today about this eventual possibility of detecting our acceleration through space, which, you know, given the almost univocal meaning that the word acceleration has had in this conference, I need to specify better because I'm talking about our proper acceleration as observer with respect to the cosmic microwave background. I'm not talking about the global acceleration of the metric of the background. And eventually, uh, our nonlinear, non inertial motion is generated by the large scale structures that there are around us, that are surrounding us. And so, eventually, I will be able in this talk, and that probably is the main goal, to set up, a, to establish a, a link between this local notion of acceleration with the global one and see, for example, what astrometry, which is the channel of observation that we are advocating with this study, can say about eventually modified gravity. So I try more or less to explain the second part of my title. The first sentence here, in plain English, means the signal is weak. But it's there. So I know because I'm a crazy old guy that there is no point in belaboring about something that doesn't exist when people are starving, when there is lunch. Uh, but I want to make it clear that this is a weak signal and probably already at the edge of detection with current instrument, instrumentations. So that's what made us excited. And when I mean us, is me and my collaborators in Marseille, Julien Bell, Louise Perrinon, and Federico Piazza. So um, it is also of, often said today that cosmology is you know, uh, in a golden era and that uh, probably is the fastest growing industry in the world. Uh, there is, what is the meaning underlying this pretentious claim? Probably because there never has been so many uh, observations so decisive, so precise, that squeeze down error bars in uh, such a small uh, time interval. However, my own uh, um, definition of progress in the field is the rapidity with which systematics are coming to dominate over a statistical uh, signal. And probably there is an even better definition that is you know, uh, progress is measured by the number of papers invoking new physics to explain uh, uh, tensions. But whatever is your own way of defining progress in the field, this is mine. And that's the plot that uh, attracted our attention and got us involved in an astrometry, let's say. So this is a plot of the precision with which you can fix the absolute position of extragalactic or uh, uh, galactic objects as a function of time. So you see that between Hipparchus the astronomer and Hipparchus the satellite, basically over 2,000 years we gain four orders of magnitude in precision. But then something very suddenly happened here. In 30 years, we gain the same four orders of magnitude precision and going for, with satellites like Hipparchus and now with Gaia. So oh, that's probably interesting. So what astronomy has to say about modified gravity? That was the <laughs> incipit of this study. And you know, the tale goes like uh, that if you are on a boat and you're sailing and it's raining and you're having a beer on the boat, better you know how to incline the umbrella, at least if you care about the beer. More professionally, you know, since the Earth is moving with respect to some reference frame, let's say, the frame of distant stars, then you should see the stars that are not at the real position, but their position is shift by a small angle, the aberration angle, which is order V over C. V is our velocity, and C is the speed of light. However, there is no way to measure that angle, because that's a velocity, so we cannot detect our velocity. But since the Earth is accelerating around the Sun, so that vector changes, you can see that split uh, uh, in a uh, in sky, which you order 20 arc second. That's generated by our acceleration as observer on the Earth around the Sun. So the question was, OK, what would be the effect expected if we are accelerating with respect to the Hubble flow? So there is a simple back of the envelope calculation. is this. Theta dot will be over the order h beta, beta being our velocity with respect to the Hubble flow, so our proper peculiar velocity. So Thanks God, this beta is large for us. It's 630 kilometers per second, and is revealed by the dipole in the CMB. <coughs> so we said, okay, 
you come up with an estimation that for every source that you have in the sky, very distant source, I'm talking about quasar, extragalactic source, you expect a shift, coherent shift of 0.4 micro arc second every 10 years. And that is almost at the edge of what the Gaia satellite is measuring as precision, which is from one micro arc second to 200 micro arc second. So, since we can average over a lot of quasars, and we can beat down statistics, you say, okay, let's see, let's do some more complicated calculation here and see that everything works. Basically, more complicated calculation means include gravity, okay? Because this is just a back of the embryo calculation order of magnitudes. So before doing that, let me briefly sketch uh, in a very um, non-exhaustive way what Gaia is. Uh, Gaia is a satellite which is orbiting around the Sun-Earth uh, Lagrangian, uh, second Lagrangian point at 1.5 million kilometers from Earth, and is providing a precision map of position for stars, essentially for one billion stars in our galaxy with this fantastic precision. But fortunately for us, there are also extragalactic objects. And so that's the, the, the object that we, are, we take care about. So this is real, okay? The, the satellite is up in the sky, is taking data, uh, the nominal mission is uh, five years, but there are already plans to extend it for five, uh, other five years. So we will fly for 10 years. That's very good for us because um, that's a whole sky survey of distant quasar. And not only is a whole sky survey, but they are going to pass on the same area of sky at, multiple, uh, at different times. So we have time lags between uh, different exposures. And so we can see, in some sense, the sky moving if we have enough precision. And uh, for our purposes, they are uh, surveying uh, something like uh, 500,000 quasar with precision going from 1 to 200 micro seconds. So we are almost there with the order of magnitude estimations. So let's do uh, some uh, uh, estimation which are more precise. Uh, take a perturbation, which is just color, so we uh, forget about any other contribution um, to the uh, distortion in the metric, and say, okay, what would, be hap would happen if I'm moving with respect to this uh, uh, moving coordinate system with this four vector? And uh, specifically, what happens to the momentum of the photon uh, that is seen by the observer who is moving with respect to this metric? And so, up to the definition of proper peculiar velocity, which is this beta here, which is now including also contribution from phi and psi with respect to the standard definition at uh, Newtonian level, we can come up with a you know, usual <laughs> formula for aberration that a local inertial observer would see, uh, uh, considering uh, how a distant and inertial star is uh, appearing in a moving system. So, now take the derivative of this, which is take the derivative of the variation of this angle, the aberration angle, with respect to the proper time of the observer who is moving. And then you come up with a formula that at leading order, counting, you know, grad of phi as uh, order of v over c and phi order v square over c square, which is essentially contributed by two sources. First is our motion, clearly, with respect to the, uh, let's get, call it the moving system. And the other contribution comes from a, a time variation of the source itself, okay? So quasar, they have their own proper motion. They have their own time-dependent acceleration. But fortunately, since they are very distant, um, that term here doesn't contribute. There is an extra subtle effect, which should be a time-dependent lensing effect. So the signal, the direction where the photon is coming depends on the fact that in 10 years, lensing is changing. But that effect order of magnitude is H theta Einstein. So all these effects that I'm talking about are order one tenth of a na nano micro arc second. So they're negligible for our purposes. And I'm talking just about estimating this beta dot. So let's do uh, very simple stuff because I need to in include modify gravity in an understandable way. So just assume that uh, you know, our motion is generated by mass distribution that is not perturbing the, the background, the classical Newtonian approximation. And so consider the uh, field equation for gravity uh, that we modify, including the uh, usual uh, g-effective uh, uh, Newton constant, and then continuity for matter, and also an equation of motion, which depends on grad phi. So by solving the first two of these, you end up saying that the grad phi is aligned with our own velocity. Okay? And this is because we are on large scale, 
We neglect the decay modes in the solution, and that's fair enough because we are doing measurements today and the decay modes are already gone away. <coughs> and clearly, as you showed before, we are neglecting uh, vector contribution. Uh, the fluid is irritation. Now, put back this in the equation of motion, and this is the equation that gives you the amplitude of the acceleration, the local acceleration that is sourced, essentially, by the large scale structure. This is a linear formula. And clearly, we have to define what is the object to which we have to apply this acceleration here. So unfortunately, there is a, a compensation factor here. So there is a cancellation between the effect that you would expect uh, induced on our acceleration by the expansion of the universe, which is going to suppress peculiar velocity, essentially as 1 over the scale factor of the universe, and the pool of gravity, which is going to restore uh, the amplitude of the peculiar velocity. Since we are belaboring since long about lambda CDM coincidences, then it happens that here, if you put omega matter equal one third, mu equal one, and f almost equal to one over two, then you end up bearing all the signal. So there is this kind of coincidence in lambda CDM that today the acceleration of observers with respect to the CMB is hugely suppressed with respect to what, for example, you could have in an Einstein decision universe. That's why we are taking care of this mu here, because uh, in terms of precision of the signal, this uh, term here is going to count a lot, and I will show after. So who is who in this game? What we refer as the acceleration to with, uh, which we respect we are accelerating. So we are talking about the relative acceleration between us and what? So the first is a distance frame of quasars. So if you take averages of uh, distant quasar over large scales, sufficiently large, in which sense? But in the sense in which, in the standard model of cosmology, the average bulk flows of that volumes goes to zero when we are averaging over large scales. So this is um, essentially what you expect. The bigger the size of your fluid element, and the faster the bulk flow is going to be negligible. And so you can take the reference frame of quasar as the one with respect to which we are making measurements. However, there is a simple and less poetic way of saying this is quasars are so far away that their proper motion, whatever they are doing, <laughs> is out of any capability. So they are, in, in some sense, quasi inertia. They are co-moving, OK? On a single quasar basis. I not even need to, to do averages and then uh, assume that uh, since their b is small, that their acceleration is also small. Now, who is the server? Clearly, uh, the satellite is measuring what? is measuring the aberration drift, uh, which is induced by its own motion with respect to the quasars. And that can be decomposed into the satellite motion with respect to the sun, the motion of the sun with respect to the center of the Milky Way, the Milky Way center with respect to the local group, and then finally, what we identify as the observer who is feeling the large scale structure uh, <coughs> gravitational field and who is changing its acceleration with respect to the CMB. So if Finally, we identify the quasar frame as uh, usually done with the CMB frame, and then the high velocity of the observer with respect to that frame is something that is going to favor our signal. So let's uh, do it uh, with a uh, brief illustrative uh, um, uh, plot. This is the satellite. The satellite is uh, orbiting around the L2 points, uh, and uh, all the system is orbiting around the sun. But all these aberration drift, which is induced by that acceleration, the strongest signal in the game, is taken uh, already uh, out at data processing level. So data are already cleaned by this effect of aberration. Then there is a second effect, very interesting. Uh, the sun itself is turning around the galaxy. It's turning because of two components, essentially, you know, the uh, orbital motion here, the centripetal acceleration of gravity, induced by the centripetal acceleration of gravity, and then an harmonic oscillation because the sun is uh, uh, oscillating through the, the disk of the galaxy. Now, this vector here, the velocity vector, is changing in time. So it's inducing another uh, component of the, aber the aberration. And indeed, you can use this aberration here in order to study the rotation of our galaxy, the rotation actually of the halo. That's one of the purposes. And indeed, these effects amount to four microsecond per year per source. So it's already seen in the maps of the uh, Gaia satellite. And indeed, it acts as a coherent bulk flows of all the object that seems to converge where, the, uh, where is the acceleration vector pointing. And in that case, being the centripetal acceleration, is pointing toward the center of our galaxy. So. Question is, 
let's go step forward. What's the next signal? What's the next acceleration? It is the acceleration of the Milky Way with respect to, uh, let's say, the local group center because we are part of a nonlinear system which is composed by small galaxies, essentially small mass that do not contribute to our motion, but also by a big mass uh, which is essentially contributing what we call the mass of the local group. So in, in what follow, we will simply identify the local group center with the, with the center of Andromeda. So this is nonlinear motion, how we model that, usually like it is done in literature. We suppose that the local group is a galaxy of the density that decoupled from the cosmological expansion, so uh, initial density, it, it expands in linear regime with the expansion of the universe, then at some point it gets nonlinear, it decouples, and it forms a bound gravitational system. So we can treat that in fully nonlinear Newtonian spherical collapse model. Uh, there are plenty of uh, precise data about our motion in that system. Uh, essentially, the local group is moving with 132 kilometers per second towards Andromeda. Okay, this is a blue shift, and uh, the separation uh, is 1.7 megaparsec, I think, and we are really headed towards uh, M31. So there will be probably a major, uh, a major catastrophe in the future, but. For us, that means that the vector, the velocity vector, is aligned with the separation vector. So here is the acceleration. You do the Newtonian spherical model. And here, too, there are two terms. One, which is, again, the expansion, because we are talking about something that is expanding, also on that scale, and the contribution of gravity, which is pulling. And hopefully enough, what happens is that Andromeda happens to be exactly at the distance, 0.7 megaparsec, where the expansion rate of the universe is exactly compensated by the gravitational pull of Newtonian force exerted, exerted, exerted by the two, the two body system. And indeed, the B dot, the acceleration, is zero, essentially. So it's one order of magnitude smaller than the signal that we are looking for. That's something that is a, is a coincidence that helps the signal, because we are um, excluding a major contribution of the acceleration just based on that uh, lucky fact that a 0.7 megaparsec for a mass of 10 to the 12 megapar uh, 10 to the 12 solar masses, you know, expansion is exactly compensated by um, gravitational pull. So there is a last question: How well grad phi is proportional to beta to the velocity, the super Hubble velocity, for local group systems? Because that's a formula that you know is linear formula, as holds on large scales. I say, is the local group a system that can be treated with this kind of approximation? So we took a simulation uh, that is large enough to have the possibility to identify a large statistical sample of systems that we call local group environment, and we define them by filtering uh, all the simulation uh, points, the masses, on a smoothing scale of three megaparsec which is essentially the size of the local group. And then by selecting objects as local group, if their over density contrast is zero, essentially. That comes from um, uh, results from uh, other simulation, not the studies of the local group. So essentially, what is a zero density system on a three megaparsec scale is following this grad phi proportional to beta relationship. And it's following in a very nice way, not only because the one sigma, the 68% uh, uh, probability distribution function is confined to be plus 30, plus 45 kilometers per second, so we have a control in the velocity dispersion, but also on the alignment. So you can, you know, even at two sigma, for example, here, the velocity vector in the simulations is misaligned with respect to the uh, grad phi by not more than 17 degrees. So that's very nice. Uh, we can control this error. Is, by the way, is, I say 30 kilometers per second, so it's one order of magnitude smaller the error than the signal that we are <coughs> expecting, which is 600 kilometers per second. So what's the observational signature of this effect? So you imagine that you have a whole sky quasars. And those quasars you know, move day by day up to 10 years just because we are moving with that acceleration that I showed you. Unfortunately, on a, the signal on each quasar is order 0.5 microsecond. And uh, so it's completely dominated by uh, uncertainties uh, that comes from the precision with which you detect the position of the quasars. Anyway, what we do is, uh, you know, this is a vector field. It's a 2D vector field on the sphere. It is irrotational, so we are ca we're carrying just about um, the, um, uh, rotation, uh, the, the rotational modes. And we take the divergence of the vector field and we decompose that divergence on, uh, on, uh, on a sphere. And here is, for, for example, the precision with which we can detect the dipole generated by our acceleration 
which is not the dipole generated by our motion with respect to the CBB, the velocity dipole, but which is predicted to be aligned exactly at the same, in the same position. So this is a test if the signal that we are measuring is the signal that we are looking. It has to point where the CMB kinematic dipole is point. And here is the precision with which it can be recovered. If you imagine that uh, you have these 500,000 quasar measured, all of them with precision 1, 7, or 10 microsecond uh, um, per source. So um, there is other ca characteristic signature that we are looking for. This should be a dipole modulated signal, so it must be a sinusoidal signal. So if you take averages now, you don't decompose uh, the, the field on a spherical using spherical models, but you take averages at equal theta, then what happens is that you expect to see this uh, uh, sinusoidal signal that uh, perhaps seen, and that signal should be distance independent. So you can take subsample of the quasar, uh, any combination at different distances, any combination of uh, its frequency independence or any, any kind of colors of the quasar or uh, any kind of spectra, and it should be always the same kind of signal that uh, should be um, traced. There is also a small reconstruction bias here because we are reconstructing the dipole using spherical harmonic decomposition, but that is uh, completely uh, dominated by um, uh, statistical uncertainties in the instrument. So where we are, this is the precision on the amplitude of the signal which goes from, let's say, 0 to 100% in precision error. And that's the formula that we can forecast for uh, the precision of the measurement. So basically, the precision, pre precision is uh, increased by increasing the number of sources that you have in your old sky uh, survey. It is increased by increasing, <coughs> it, it is increased by decreasing the time lag between first observation and the last observation, the time lag for seeing the sky to moving. It is increased by decreasing, increasing the precision of your measurement. And unfortunately, there is this cancellation factor that conspires because it's spatting up the, uh, the error. So where are we? This is the uh, window of Gaia, one microsecond, probably is four better here. We have to put, but it's one, let's say one, up to 200. I just saw this because this is what we predict in terms of precision as a function of the number of sources. Let's say you have 5,000 quasar with this precision from 0.1 microsecond to 1 microsecond, or you have, let's say, a million of quasar with uh, you know, um, precision that can be also um, uh, relaxed on, on, on astrometry. So we are not quite there. Why? Because this is the window of Gaia, but in this window, at 1 microsecond precision, there are zero quasar, because Gaia was designed to survey local stars. So they are doing a fast photometry on the sky, and they are taking just very bright, uh, very bright stars. So the quasar that enters are very faint quasar. And unfortunately, even at 20 micron arc second here, where we have our last point at 100% precision, they have only 5,000 quasar, which is not enough because at that precision we should need something like around 500,000 quasar, quasars. However, what do we need to get a 5% precision on the signal? So let's say that we keep no increase in current te technology with which we uh, measure uh, astrometric position. Let's say that in the future, in the future, in the next 10 years, we still will be able to measure only one microsecond uh, positions. Then in that case, you need to increase photometry in order to have that one microsecond position measure also for faint quasar and not only for bright stars. However, there are already uh, proposals for satellites, uh, 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 the proposal to ESA, the, the TAI satellite, which increase the microsecond precision, they go to sub-microsecond precision to 0.1 microsecond precision. In that case, you will need, for example, just one sample of quasar that is 20,000 quasars. But you know, future is good, but we can do something also. Uh, yes, Emily. Uh, No, whatever it is, uh, an object, uh, yeah. Because up to, up to today, quasars in the Gaia map, uh, they are not uh, uh, sources that they wanted to see. It's just sources that they could not distinguish apart from stars. So they are kind of pollution. So it's just, you know, whatever is the distance of the object, that this effect here is independent of the distance of the object. So it should be outside the galaxy? It should be outside the galaxy. It should be moving. Yeah, it should be moving. Should be, and even if it's not moving, should be far, 
far away so much that the proper motion of that object and its proper acceleration you know, doesn't count because it's, uh, let's say, one nine, nine arc second, so it's that, okay, I'm just comparing to, to that system. Uh, we are looking quasars. We are not looking at CMB. I'm talking about CMB, but we're looking at quasars. That's the reference frame. You know? uh, we are going to see if it's moving or not because of that. Uh, so uh, after a certain right shift that, that is, uh, let's say, let's say, yeah, let's say that the, the, what, what counts is more than redshift is the angular distance of the source because you have to multiply the angles. And that it goes up very fast. So let's say that a redshift of 0.2, you're already at one gigaparsec in the standard cosmological mode. So one gigaparsec is what is suppressing, essentially, you know, a distance of one megaparsec to the quasar is what is suppressing this. So say is it supposed to be greater also? Like yeah. Because it has smaller it's a smaller field of view, but you, you need 20,000 quasars. Yeah, if you, because that is, uh, uh, must be tailored in some way. So we are proposing to have uh, on board that uh, an open instrument space. So to have on board the possibility to carry over surveys on a specific, so uh, that's a very interesting question actually. This is a, a dipole signal. So there are regions in sky where the signal is higher. Mm -hmm. Essentially is, you know, a pi over two from the apex. And so you just point there to maximize the signal. You need 20,000 quasar in that direction to see the coherent bulk towards the apex. So, so you know the direction? Uh, uh, yeah, because it's, it theory predicts that it has to go in the apex of the CMB. If it's not there, <laughs> it's not the signal that we are looking for. Mm -hmm. There may be something else, but it's not the signal that we are looking for. It, it should point there. Sorry, sure. Do lengthening affect Sure. But again, it's length in variation in 10 years period. So if you do the calculation, that is completely negligible. A variable length, yes, is a change in the. So you have theta, basically. Uh, uh, you have theta in this formula. I go back a little bit. Yeah. OK, this. So here, basically, you have two thetas. OK, one is the theta is the position of the object in the co-moving frame. And the theta prime is the same position, but in the moving frame. Now, they change because of two effects, because theta prime here is the, the one that is seen by the moving observer, the, the accelerating one. And theta is changing because of whatever is changing the co-moving coordinates of the sources. So its own proper motion, uh, the fact that it's not a real co-moving source, but also the fact that in 10 years, you know, that object is not only accelerating, but lengthening can change. Okay, we don't care about the absolute value of lensing on that object, but the fact that in 10 years, that lensing would change. But, you know, that's a H of a H type theta Einstein, essentially, if, if you want to be very generous in the estimation. So there are th at least three, four, four orders of magnitude smaller than the effect that we are looking for. Yeah. Oops. Too fast. My PowerPoint crashed. No, I don't send. So see again, so it's sticking in your mind. No, <laughs> <laughs> So let's see here what modified gravity can do for us, because that's the hope. <laughs> OK, this is the precision, for example. Let's say that we get down to 5% precision with those kind of missions. And so what are the information that we can have out of this kind of test? First is probably uh, a nice CMB independent evidences supporting the standard kinematical interpretation of the, C the CMB dipole. Okay, so we are really moving in that direction. We are not only moving. We are also accelerating, as predicted by the large scale structure distribution. Uh, and then you can have constraint on H0 uh, or omega matter, which are orthogonal, and so you break the degeneracy, for example, of what is obtained for, fr from other missions. Okay? So th th this is more like a consistency, a nice consistency set check that the paradigm is working and that uh, uh, you know, hypotheses are well, well founded in the standard model of cosmology. However, let's see what happened. I, I told you that if you average over a large number of sources, the bulk motion, the average motion of the centroid of the fluid element should go to zero. However, when you plot on that theoretical line actual measurements, 
you see that uh, probably there is also this tendency to have bulk flows that are a little bit higher in amplitude with respect to what is predicted by lambda CDN. And this is a problem that keeps kicking in in, uh, in the community since a uh, uh, long time. So there are proposals, for example, that these anomalies could be alleviated if there is modified gravity acting on large scales in the local universe that pump up the signal and push um, the uh, effective Newton constant to be larger than one, for example. So what we did was to consider um, our density class of modified gravity models in the AFT language. Um, thanks, thanks God it's Friday, so I don't have to go back to, to this theory that was very uh, well presented in this conference. What I care about is just uh, how to model this new, uh, the, this um, effective gra Newton gravitational constant in our equations. And that can be done in terms of four free functions because we keep always fixed the background. We always assume that the background is lambda CDN and we just want to see how modified gravity enters in the perturbation sector. So uh, what we found uh, in a series of paper uh, with uh, uh, Federico, with the uh, students, uh, Steigerwald and Perenon, was that despite the fact that these um, uh, mu has uh, uh, huge uh, degrees of freedoms. Uh, by fixing some uh, natural conditions, like for example, imposing stability conditions, no gradients, no ghost instabilities, or observational constraints that your model have to satisfy nucleosynthesis, or that in screen environment, the part of G effective, which is uh, taking care about the attraction of mass, e is exactly G Newton. Then there is this kind of universal behavior in which G effective is always overestimated you know, in those models with respect to the lambda CDM prediction at redshift zero, essentially. That was okay, let's see what happened. For a class of models, the simplest one, Brans Dickey models in, a, in the class of uh, those theories, that are still compatible with current data. So we just randomly generate parameters in our uh, parametric uh, implementation of EFT and say, okay, just pick models that you know, are within one sigma uh, uh, and they are not ruled out by current data. And then just draw a PDF a distribution of the ratio between G effective and the growth rate, the linear growth rate function f, which is the logarithmic derivative here of density fluctuation with respect to the scale factor of the universe, and see how that number changes. And you see that there is a huge uh, variation of this mu over f um, when you consider models that are still not ruled down. And that's good because if you take mu over f of order 3, 3.54, you see that the signal is coming in where we have a lot of quasars. So even at, at a let's say, an, an unfavorable precision of 150, megaparsec, uh, 150 microsecond, we could have a signal which is detected at 60% of precision if mu over f is equal 4. And that's again because that mu over f moves this term away from 1, and that uh, counteracts uh, cancellation. But what is good is that now if you invoke stronger gravity to have a signal, there will be a nice effect that the acceleration vector flips over and it will not point in the direction of the CMB dipole, but in the uh, anti direction, so in the opposite direction. So you will see that we are decelerating now because there is stronger gravity, which is, uh, sorry, we are accelerating because there is stronger gravity, and that's not counteracted by uh, cosmological expansion. So that would be a clear smoking gun in some sense, okay? We don't invoke uh, that we are going to explain uh, the same data with new models, but it's okay, this is a nice prediction if this is going to uh, work. So, I'm done. These are my conclusion. I try to convince myself before you that astrometry is the future. So that, you know, should provide some fundamental insight in physics and uh, not a bit in gravitation. And, and at least because, you know, there is a historical record that astrometry did uh, provide a good testing benchmark for uh, general relativity. So what I argue is that the acceleration of the local group centric observer with respect to distant quasar could tell us uh, the link between local dynamics, dynamics and large-scale structure, and in particular, um, uh, dark energy or modified gravity. Unfortunately, real-time cosmology is not yet real cosmology, but the, if the real model of the universe is not lambda CDM, we probably are already there with the detection window, and there is a smoking gun that says, okay, we should accelerate if gravity is stronger, uh, and not to the opposite decelerating. So the signal is weak, uh, but characteristic, so is aligned with the CMB dipole, is sinusoidal, is distance independent, and so it's weak, but you know, it's there. However, there could be this, you know, a motivation for um, further thinking about how can we use those kind of very nice uh, surveys that are measuring with high precision position of <coughs> extragalactic distances to think about something, you know, out of the box thinking about uh, 
heavy progress in the field. Thanks. Um, I got a bit confused about your estimate of the acceleration of the local group when you include also the Hubble flow. I mean, yeah. Why is that? Because I would say if I go to the local Newtonian frame, I just see, you know, like I have local group, I have some uh, center of mass of the local group, and I'm accelerating there, so I don't see any Hubble flow acceleration at this point. Sure, sure, sure. So why, why, why do you include that? Uh, no, I'm not including, actually. So this is the uh, result of uh, uh, calculation with the uh, spherical collapse. So if you do spherical collapse, yes. uh, basically you assume that there is a metric that is expanding, and then you put a perturbation on that metric. But then you keep having uh, that model in your calculation. So at the end of the day, what you see is that the acceleration is a, you know, has two terms, one that comes from the mass and one that comes from the expansion of the background. A second way of seeing that is that take just a Newtonian simulations of masses, okay? When you put masses... Yeah, on just the Newtonian theory. Yeah. Perfect, but Newtonian theory, if you put moving coordinates, let's say that your coordinates is A times X, the, uh, sorry, the, the physical distance is A, the scale factor of the universe times the distance, the commoving distance. Ah, because your acceleration is respect to the commoving Perfect. frame. Because I am accelerating uh. with respect to the commoving. So even in Newtonian way, the acceleration will be X dot dot equal minus HX, the dragging effect of this uh, uh, Hubble flow uh, reference frame. And apparently, mm -hmm. what we discovered, because it was nice uh, discovered for us too, was to see that Andromeda sits exactly at 0.7 megaparsec, where that cancellation is in lambda CDM today is exact almost. Mm -hmm. And say, so if you are below that distance, then you don't care about the expansion. Okay, that's, uh, even if it's there in the equation, just <laughs> don't consider it. And then if you are a little bit uh, outside that radius, then you there is contribution from the expansion. Mm -hmm. So you can do analogous calculation in the solar system, for example. No, so if, if instead of 10 to the 12 solar masses, I have the mass of the sun, mm -hmm. okay, and then I, I, I did a spherical collapse model, you know, in, in the way a simulator is doing. So what, what is the distance where I have expansion effects or, or not expansion? Effects? Yeah, I understand. So and, and also, what about other sources of acceleration, like uh, I mean, a local cluster, supercluster? Sure, uh, very good question. Uh, so that a major. A ma our major source of concern, actually, is that how good is the fact that we describe the average gravitational field by phi, let's say that, that's uh, the phi of the, of the fluid, and how well is our motion sensitive to the phi of the theory and not to specific uh, clusters that are around us, like Virgo or uh, s some other cluster, so yeah. if we are more specific. And so we did that uh, analysis with simulations just to see how well this is the result. So here we take simulations. We filter all the simulation on uh, top hat uh, filters of 3 megaparsec. Basically, 3 megaparsec because uh, local group is that extension, has that extension. And we know that local group in, in that sphere has zero density, okay? zero over density contrast. So it's the density in the local group on that sphere is the same of the, uh, of the, uh, of the average density of matter in the universe. So what happens is that, let's say in those simulations where close by you have another mass, let's say Virgo, the Virgo of the simulation or another, let's see how misaligned is that prediction for that kind of system that I call the local group. Mm -hmm. And see, uh, the, the scatter here, okay, this is our study. There is, a, I didn't put here a, a reference, but 2014, Adi Nasser came up with a similar estimation using uh, other simulations. They say, how well is our motion reconstructed via linear theory of the large scale structure? And you know, simulation tells you that you know, this is one sigma, this is two sigma, a one sigma went 35 kilometer per second scatter in the amplitude of the signal. And you have a misalignment, the fact that the grad phi at the position where you are filtering the field is misaligned with respect to the velocity vector that there is in the simulation, the peculiar velocity that is uh, uh, calculated in the simulation by no more than, let's say, eight degrees in, uh, so it's uh, a subdominant, this arrow, with respect to the uh, amplitude that, uh, of the signal that we are looking for. And that happens because uh, we are, Big at a at, 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 at enough, large enough distance from the center of the cluster. Perfect, is it perfect. Yeah. So, uh, Where the over density is, is zero, that, that you say. Yeah. Is, uh, so we are a linear system in some sense. Yeah. We are a, 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 a system that is linear and that is far away, let's say Virgo is 20 megaparsec and uh, the Centaurus is 40 megaparsec and then there are other sources. But then is in a coarse grain picture, uh, picture, you know, their action is already explained by linear theory. So you don't need to go with a specific model of, of, of all those structures, mm -hmm. at least to d as good as this precision that comes from these simulations. I see. And may I ask a final question? So uh, yeah, you say it should be aligned with, uh, with the dipole, but the dipole has uh, also contributions from the 
peculiar motion in the galaxy. Perfect. Also the Once you decompose those motions, yeah. That, yeah. Right. In, fact, in fact, if you if you look at that picture here, uh, a well-trained eye should see that oh, this point should be here, but that is the heliocentric velocity of the CMB. So it's the motion of the sun with respect to the CMB. We cannot look at that. We have to. Uh, how, how can you subtract? The, the, the because numbers? there are studies uh, of motion in the local systems, uh, so you can uh, study what is the motion of the Milky Way with respect to the local. So you group. simulate basically. That, uh, no, no, no. It's uh, just observation. Yeah, no, no. It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's so basically, when uh, when CMB studies, uh, I mean the the Kogut uh, 1993 papers who, who were talking about these uh, uh, dipoles, you have to convert that signal, which is the observed signal of, of let's say, uh, <laughs> a CMB satellite into something which is cosmological. And everybody quotes the other number, the one that I'm talking about here, the one that is uh, the vector of the local group with respect to the, uh, to the CMB. Mm -hmm. But you can do that uh, based on uh, the error there I didn't quote is something like 20 kilometers per second on the amplitude, 630 plus, plus minus 20, and the misalignment is order of the degree. So it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's very controlled how you go from the heliocentric system to the local group system, okay. the observations. Mm -hmm. Um, so first a comment, so on this, in this modified Gary picture, I think you have to be a little bit careful because you're quoting a linear theory prediction for G and um, you know, it's, it's going to be screened in one way or another, so the sort of expected... Delta equals zero. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, no, but look, well, I mean, it's... De the, delta it's I the mean, sort, it, so I'm this talking is about fluid elements, so mm -hmm. whatever it is uh, below the scale of the, s of the filtering for me, it's, uh, you know, it's something that... Well, okay. I mean, I, I just. Uh, but I mean, I, I think it will be a bit lower. But the. But but again, as another question is sort of so. Okay, so if this is happening to quasars, then I guess this is also happening to the CMB. CMB, of course, is not measured in any that, way. That precision. precision, I don't think. That but there's more of it. Right. It's kind of it's the whole sky yeah, 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 in principle. Well, okay, apart from the galaxy. That. That probably yes. Probably we should see ah. if we can see signal of the acceleration. For example, uh, there are s signals um, that comes by studying how our motion with respect to the CMB, which generates a dipole, mm. leaks, uh, into uh, the other leaks into high multiples and see uh, that you can uh, verify that we are moving with that velocity. But actually see that that signal is changing <laughs> over, let's say, 10 years, because of that is, uh, we are accelerating because of the attraction of all the sources. That will be a real challenging mm. experiment, I think. I mean, for high enough L and precision, right? For the, I mean, the, grass, the ground based guys, at least. Yeah, because you know, that, that's the advantage. They're ground-based, so you can keep uh, doing that year after year and see if there is any, any drift that, you, that exactly. you're going to see because we are accelerating as a, as a vector. So is there any hope to increase the signal-to-noise, including hyperchos data? You know, the previous satellite, I mean, the, the accuracy is much smaller but the the time the time span you know of the observations is much longer so oh in 200 years also the 200 micron arc second precision will be very useful at some point because you know i, I keep st saying students you know why newton believed that the universe was static because he had a catalog from hyparchos who said the star is here the star is here the star is here and so newton said they didn't move so it must be static so at some point in 2000 years, the catalog of Hipparchus, which was now very precise in position, was used to build up a model. So in 200 years, the 200 microsecond precision would be for sure something. You know, I, I'm talking about the, the satellite, I mean the predecessor of, of Gaia. Yeah. Uh, can, can you use that data because it's, it's 20 years old, that data already? So No, no, it, that is six months old because the satellite just... Uh, six months? Yeah. So. We need to wait 10 years just to see if there is any lucky, let's say that's wishful thinking you know, about gra modified gravity, but there is some appealing feature that should be there and uh, if we see that. Uh, but for sure, data from, uh, from Gaia will be helpful because uh, you keep increasing and go back to the same precision and see what, how changed the sky in that time. Okay, 